This is a special Humans Event Cycling podcast, recorded last week live in front of an audience at Cadence Performance in South London. The first part is available to download right now, and this is the second part, a Q&A with the audience. This is part two of our Humans and Event Cycling Podcast Live, uh, an event in association with Cycling Anthology. And this is the questions round with the, the exciting prize of um, two tickets for Revolution, which I know Daniel has got his eye on. They, they were my tickets. They were your tickets. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, hands up please for... Uh, any questions? I was wondering about your opinion if there's any other riders out there that really do thrive in the cold, top of the salad, or vice versa, really, really thrive in the heat and amplitude that affects riders' ability to perform the day. So the question is about a quote Tom Boonen said he didn't like the wet and cold of Het Newsblad, uh, and how much does weather uh, affect different riders? Which riders perform well in, in the heat and which perform well in the, in the cold? It's, it's sometimes quite surprising that riders from from cold countries perform well in the heat and vice versa. I don't. It's. I'm trying to think of an example because I, one did occur to me. But <laughs> there was one. No, just, just the other day I was reading about this very scenario, and it's gone. But Daniel can fill in for a moment while I think of it. You do get right. Is there, um, this is a bad example because he's just retired. But um, Sandy Kazar was someone who needed it to be absolutely red hot and just was a rider who could have done well in the Arden classics and stuff but never really did just because it was often cold and didn't really like it but Aston Hagen he tends to like the cold he used to be related to how effective amphetamines were in certain <laughs> types of weather <laughs> going back a few decades I mean I don't know how, how true it is but that's always been said about Charlie Gould Charlie Gould was famous for these incredible epic rides not all of his epic rides were in cold wet conditions but a lot were and it's often been speculated that that was because he took an awful lot of amphetamines I remember the cyclist Allegedly. the cyclist in question was Lance Armstrong oh, yeah. I don't know <laughs> I don't know how I forgot him but you know, that, it, he, did he win the 1998 tour of Luxembourg was it that guy That's he his did last, right? he was in last last, last, last significant win. victory um, <laughs> he uh, but he, he he hated the heat didn't he and yet he was from Texas which is hot and he, he performed well in the cold and the, and the rain. Was that that was based on? I always think that was based on one day that when he lost the time trial to Ulrich. Also, if you think about ninety nine no? Sestria or was Sestria was that bad? That was bad weather, wasn't it? Ninety nine. Yeah, he won the world title in Oslo in, exactly. in the cold case. And the rain. Case proven. He also won. He also won endless stages in blazing heat. He was really good, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> um, Ellis. <laughs> Are you a hot, hot weather rider or a cold weather rider? <laughs> well, you know, you have to take what you get, don't you, really? But, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I've, I've not, I don't mind, really, but being out in the rain. If it you, wasn't actually if you're about, out... It wasn't. The question wasn't about us. <laughs> I know. Well, actually, you just said it was I, like, I yeah, turned it on its head. I know. Um, well, but, think... yeah, well, yeah it's, I, I don't know. I guess a lot of, lot of racers, you know, it, it, there is that old thing, isn't there, about sort of if you... You know, just get on with it or, or train in the rain. You know, the whole idea that most people hate it. So if, if you can become a sort of specialist in, in cold, wet weather, you know, you're, you're going to have a, a better chance of winning because a lot of people ride just quite rightly like, like us. You know, you sort of switch off, don't you, and just try and get through. Yeah, I think Sean Kelly famously, the, the, the quote that I, I don't think he ever said, but uh, about, you know, getting up in the morning and if it was raining, he'd, he'd be rubbing his hands together. I'd, he said, uh, um, you know, that wasn't really the case. But what it did mean for him was that it automatically num- you know, cut down the number of people who could potentially win, um, win the race. Already, you know, there might only be 20 people who could win. Uh, a race like um, Paris-Roubaix or the Tour of Lombardy, and then if it was sheeting down with rain, you know that cuts that number down to maybe five, 
um, and then there's going to be crashes and bad luck and, and, and so he's, he's seized on the poor weather as an opportunity uh, and of course he, he really didn't like the heat um, when he suffered the most in the Tour de France was on the roasting hot days he lost the yellow jersey the only time he had it um, in the Pyrenees on a, on a really hot day it just he suffered terribly with the heat that day I think there was a question at the back there as well yeah do we think Alejandro Valverde has shown how to beat Sky in a stage race or was Richie Port not strong enough to do a job you're talking about the uh, tour of Andalusia no yeah Andalusia yeah Ruta, Ruta del Sol yeah Ruta del Sol Andalusia yeah, yeah I was getting confused there were so many races going on at that time I had to I think Valverde was in terrific form there wasn't he um, and maybe Port wasn't in, in, in such good form I mean Sky rode as though you know they were they were riding for for Port to win clearly um, it almost, almost you wonder if it's a, if it's a sort of rehearsal in, in a way Garen Thomas looked very strong on the uphill finish that Valverde won stage one after the time trial but I think Valverde looked to be in great form and, and really a, a level above everybody else and he's he's you know he's a threat but he'll have to maintain that all the way to to July I, I think that you know last year at the tour we saw teams take it to Sky and, and show how to beat Sky I mean we saw lots of really great team performances at the tour last year Daniel mentioned the Sage to Albi where Cannondale had a, a brilliant plan that they executed very well for Peter Sagan but on other days you know that in the Pyrenees we saw Movistar isolate Chris Froome didn't take advantage of that as they could have done and then on the crosswind stage we saw Omega Pharma um, Saxo Belkin all sort of team up and again put some distance between them and Froome uh, and I don't think you could say that Froome won the tour thanks to his team last year uh, you could almost say that he won the tour despite his team perhaps so you know it's not perhaps the same as 2012 when Wigan's victory in the tour was that was very much a team performance I think I do think Movistar look like the team most likely though really if anyone's going to topple Sky I've, I sort of get the impression that they're sort of they've followed the Sky model really if you like um, Val, Valverde though I'm, I mean they're, they're sort of putting everyone behind him for the tour supposedly and yeah supposedly not taking um, Nairo Quintana this year um, which seems crazy really but um, I mean Valverde obviously was, was unlucky in last year's tour he punctured at that very inopportune uh, time during the um, I think it was the 13th stage in the, uh, in the wind with all those echelons so I mean I think if Movistar do take Quintana I mean you, you want to have a a double pronged attack really I think to take on the sky you'd be crazy to put all your eggs into the the one Valverde basket I think the one ageing basket I mean can we see Valverde really winning winning the tour um, no probably not but um, I think it's always we get lulled into kind of looking at races like the Ruta del Sol and, and even sort of Paris Nice and Tirreno Adriatico because we, we hope they're going to give us some clues as to who's going to be going well later in the year but I think the you know, it sounds obvious, but the proof of the pudding is when the big guns go up against each other in the in the big races. And you know, Richie Port's season isn't going to be defined by whether or not he won the Ruta del Sol. It's going to be defined by whether he gets on the podium at the Giro. So, you know, it's a nice win for Valverde, who, again, the curve of his season is going to he's going to have a sort of mini peak for the Ardennes Classics because he always always does. So, you know, he's probably testing himself out, looking sort of four or five weeks um, at those races. That's uh, well, particularly Liège, that's not Liège, isn't it? Not, not necessarily flesh well alone. Any other questions? Yeah, at the back, right at the back there? Are you asking Bradley Wiggins, given that he wants to ride in Rio in 2016, will that be to the detriment of his final, potentially his final road season? Um, I think it would have to be, wouldn't it? He would have to be uh, building his year around competing on the track um, in Rio. Unless he goes to Rio and rides the time trial, perhaps. I mean, he has hinted at wanting to come back and ride the team pursuit, but perhaps the time trial would be an option. He's riding the time trial at the Commonwealth Games this year, which is quite interesting. I don't know. Um, but, yeah, I mean, people do tend to think that he's going to retire after 2016. I mean, his contract with Team Sky runs out at the end of this year. There is another offer there from Sky to extend that, presumably to 2016. Um, 2016 could be the last year of Team Sky as well that's when they're contracted up to um, but yeah I mean 
it's interesting. He signed with this new agency, Simon Fuller's agency, um, who look after real the real A-list sports stars. You know, Beckham, Lewis Hamilton, uh, Andy Murray, and speaking to his agent in in Mallorca, his new agent, they they've got real long term plans for him, and they see him as still being top sportsman who's who's winning big races. It's going to be interesting to see how how things pan out for him this year, next year, and, and 2016. I just wanted to add that, yeah, he talked about riding the team pursuit in Rio, but someone, I can't remember who it was, maybe one of you remembers, but someone last year had said, I oh, know he's got, he's got no chance, you know, he's never going to get in because the, well, these guys, the especially what I was going to say, now maybe, you know, they're going to think again that they, they could well, mm. well take him on. But, um, I mean, it is, it's a long way off yet, isn't it? There's a lot of things could happen yet, and um, these team pursuiters could obviously um, improve a lot yet. But I think it was more that they were, they were talking about, you know, that, the, the current track guys are such specialists that, that even somebody like Wiggins would actually struggle to get enough specific training in to, to even be as good as them. Yeah, I think on the team pursuit thing, Wiggins could certainly slot back in, but whether he could slot back into a team that's going to need to do, what, 350, whatever it's going to be, it's going to have to be low, isn't it? Whether he could slot back into a team that is so kind of front-loaded with Stephen Burke and uh, Ed Clancy as a kind of the kind of sprinters really they're kilo riders really aren't they that kick off um, and take the pursuit up to that um, phenomenal speed at the start which is the, the, the crucial first phase and, and Wiggins as a rider as much more of a kind of a diesel engine obviously a very very good one his problem is actually getting onto the wheels in those first you know first two laps really and and he would have to do a lot of work to return to that kind of sprint based um, in track endurance athlete compared to what he's been doing the last few years. I, was, I always remember Tim Carrison saying that he was surprised when he started working with Bradley Wiggins. Uh, he assumed that because he had such a, a track background that he would be um, not a sprint athlete, but he'd have a, a great top end, you know, ability to go into the red and, and um, you know, have that, that, that acceleration that a trackie often has, even an endurance rider. And he, he he said he didn't. He was he was surprised that his his profile's um, physiology is more of a road endurance rider. Um, and you know, as he gets older, I guess that that top end speed will perhaps prove more elusive. So it, it could be quite it could be quite tough for him. Daniel, you're very quiet. <laughs> any other any other questions? Yeah. So this is off the back of a debate I've had with my friends about. Uh, would head news flat be different had they had earpieces? So the question is, how do you think a lack of earpieces or indeed earpieces changed the way racers play up ta- tactically, especially in one day races where things are a fair bit less formulaic than they are in stage races? Could be an early front runner there for the competition, don't want to prejudge it at all, but that's a very good question. You could argue that perhaps it did. I mean, it was a fascinating race from a strategy point of view. Uh, Omega Pharma had several hands to play, and Sky then had, you know, the, the group chasing Stannard and, and Van Avermaet, you thought if they came back together, Sky's chances would, would increase. Now, did Stannard m- perhaps not know that Boston Hagen was there? We, I, I don't know. I mean, if, if I was the DS, I would have Stannard sit on, sit on GBA's wheel yeah. and, let, and let that group come together with EBH and then get Stannard basically to hold it all together and let EBA, EBH sprint for the win. Yeah. Because not 90 times out of 20, you'd think Stannard would lose that sprint against Greg. And it's just because Greg, I mean, he said himself he thought he'd won it already before he got there. And he made about three, three, three or four mistakes. I mean, he, he even passed him on the finish. Yeah, our, our questioner is uh, imagining himself in the team car uh, <laughs> as a DS, and uh, in his fantasy cycling, you would have had Stannard sit on Greg Van Avermaet's wheel. Yeah. And I think uh, watching it, that's probably what I would have done as well. I mean, just as a general point, I don't know if anyone here has sat in team cars with them um, in races. You, I think you'd be surprised, even when they did have radios, how little communication, how rudimentary the communication always was partly because the there's usually a big delay between what something happening you know what happens is race radio calls out numbers of um you know for instance if there's a break and often it takes quite a while for that information to come back 
by the time the information's come back, often it's it's almost redundant a lot of the time, especially in the first hour or two of races when there are breaks going constantly. And often, you know, when I've sat in team cars, often, often the, all the team managers really say, make sure we're in a break. They're not saying 112, that's so-and-so, go after him, go. Um, you know, I, I haven't been in... I mean, I've been in some team cars with some directors who had, didn't they barely even knew what country they were in I can think of one in particular <laughs> um, at the Tour de l'Avenir but um, yeah I, 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 I don't know they, yeah. they must they do vary but um, I, I think there are some directors who were a lot more communicative, communicative than others but I think a lot of it is kind of you see you've all probably seen the videos of Mark Maddio for the Francais de Jure just screaming at people and uh, in terms of like the intricacies of it tactically um, I think an awful lot always came from the riders I think that is a good point I, I, the idea that the riders are that they're like remote control cars or something being controlled by the, the, the DS and the team car is certainly incorrect ultimately it does come down to the riders I remember being through a Britain team car um, in 2010 in, in the Team Sky team car in the Tour of Britain when Team Sky had a, were in a perfect position with Garen Thomas Bradley Wiggins and Greg Henderson all in the league group and, you know, Stephen de Jong, who was driving the team car, had a pretty good idea of what they should do. But, and he did try to communicate that to the riders, but ultimately it was down to them what they did. And you, you, there's only so much you can actually control in that situation. Yeah, yeah I was just going to say, um, one of the most memorable days I've had covering cycling was the 2009 Gent Weber game, where I managed to blag my way into the HTC car with Brian Holm, who was driving, and Eric Zabel, who was... Um, cracking jokes most of the day it seemed um, and a mechanic sat in the back and, and me wedged in between the wheels and, and uh, pretty uncomfortable car sick um, inducing day but I just it was a terrible um, day weather wise um, and as Daniel said you know basically the, the idea I had it, this was at the peak of this debate about whether the, the riders should have earpiece radios and whether the managers should be able to call the shots in races and I wanted to see what actually happened in a, in a big race like that whether it was you know whether the influence from the team car was too great and I have to say you know it was, it was minimal I mean the, the practical information they can give across is uh, limited to just as you say Daniel make sure you're in the break you know we've got a right hand turn coming up winds from the left so you know a warning about crosswinds but really not not detailed tactical um, decision making and in that race in particular it split to pieces in in a terrible weather at the start in the first 30 or 40 k and after that it was just a case of you know the, the bunch is all split everywhere the cars are everywhere there's carnage all over the place nobody knows who's where whenever a rider tried to talk to the team car it's just a hiss of feedback I mean that was another thing I was going to say that bears pointing out the radios are absolute rubbish they're just junk they never ever seem to you know the number of times I've been in a team car it's like an episode of Only Fools and Horses just every single time they just what it's not working again no it's not working again I don't know if they've improved in the last I mean it's a while it's a year or two since I've been in a team car but it, it always mystified me especially with you know Sky gets so much attention for um, the amount of money they plough into technology and stuff that someone has not come up with a device that just gives you you know, perfect sound. Well, it's difficult, isn't it? Because it's playing out over such a yeah. range and they're restricted to what the aerial can do. Um, but I do remember Zaba, I was talking to them about um, when the race calmed down a bit and I was asking about um, you know, the uh, impact of race radios and um, Zaba was talking about a, uh, an edition of the Tour of Mallorca, which if, if you not familiar with it it's basically five one day races that kind of all build up into a stage race but the riders don't have to ride every day so unlike in the Tour de France where you have to ride every day to be in the results in the Tour of Mallorca which is an early season race you could ride on day one three and five if you wish or you could miss out the hilly day and only do the flat one um, and HTC were in this race and Zabel was doing the, the um, team manager bit and he was saying, OK, guys, you know, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Right, OK, guys, everything for CB, which is Marcel Seberg, who was their sprinter, um, or sort of a big sort of diesel engine. OK, everyone, everyone, get behind CB. It's all for CB now in the last 10K. And, uh, you know, he's giving, giving all of his directions. And it wasn't until they crossed the line that they realised Seberg hadn't actually started the stage and was back at the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> actually, though, having said all, all, of that, all valid points... Saturday, Het Newsbad was perhaps a day when, had there been radios, they would have told Saturday, because it was for quite a long 
time, there was certainly time and there were good time checks and the straight roads and all the rest of it, they probably would have, yeah, again, you can be too clever and they probably would have said to Stannard, sit on Van Avermaet and, you know, but Bosenhagen is coming up behind you and you've got two out of five rather than one and two. And, um, you know, that might have been the wrong decision. So, you know, I think a lot of the time as well, I remember being in the team car once with Scott Sunderland and he he didn't give the riders an awful lot of information in the last hour because he relied, he trusted their, their racing instincts. He didn't tell them when sprinters had been dropped because it didn't. He said that doesn't affect the way that they should be racing. It doesn't matter whether a, a, a rival sprinter is there or not. So I think you can, you can try to be too smart with it as well. And I think often, I mean, Stannard probably knew on Saturday that he had the legs to, to win it. The Humans Invent Cycling Podcast. Interviews and analysis. We've got the big talking points covered. So the question was about legal products um, like Xenon, the gas that apparently was used by the Russian, some of the Russian athletes at the Winter Olympics, and Tramadol, a painkiller. Um, this, is a, this is a new sort of area of anti-doping where we're kind of moved beyond the WADA list and, and we're now searching out products that aren't on the list but may be unethical um, and maybe on the list in, in the future. You know, the list changes a lot. Caffeine is not on the list at the moment, so writers use caffeine. Um, and it's, you know, at the, there was obviously a huge spotlight on Team Sky at the Tour de France last year, and we were asking them all the questions we could think of, you know, about uh, TUEs, therapeutic use exemptions. Garen Thomas struggled most of the race with a broken pelvis, so I was asking him what painkillers he was using. He said he was just using ibuprofen. He was taking ibuprofen. Um, and uh, the doctor with Team Sky, Alan Barr, said that you know they, they actually they didn't have any TUEs in the team um, because we have suspected in the past that TUEs have been abused as well. Um, but this is this is a whole new area, and it's you know it's um, it's fascinating. I don't th- there are sort of serious ethical questions about a lot of it, and you know oxygen tents as well. Um, it's not n- perhaps a natural way of preparing, but it's legal now not legal in all countries is that right but it's not they're not on the on the wada list so it's yeah it's a it it just gets more and more confusing doesn't it i definitely think that things like that are being done you know painkillers etc the the limits are being pushed in that way but i think the riders now are getting a lot of feedback about the benefits that they're getting from equipment and i think it's just it's grown exponentially and, it, and the, the important thing is the feedback I mean I, was, I mentioned earlier Sebastian Weber who's the um, coach at Canada he was we were talking about um, the sort of amateur scientists um, who are estimating wattages on climbs and saying so and so must be doping because he's um, doing 450 watts well Sebastian said that um, just to give one example um, I think last year the team he was working for, um, a changed tyre manufacturer, and the riders were complaining that the new tyres seemed grabby. They seemed, they just didn't seem to roll very well. Anyway, they went and did tests in a velodrome, and the difference between the old tyres and the new tyres was 17 watts on average. And, you know, so that's... When pe- people when people are making these calculations, they're saying that, OK, over 410 watts, or that's definitely dope and we'll live a tyre can make 17 watts and that's one piece of equipment there might be 20 pieces of equipment like that and I think the riders are, are becoming more and more aware of that and I think they've got more and more people saying to them look if you wear the skin suit that's 10 watts if you use these um, tyres that's another 20 watts so I think you know if you're getting all that information about things that you can do and I think there's less of an incentive to look for illegal things and I, I spoke to Chris Borman about this recently and about, about aerodynamics and he just thinks it's absolutely everything he can't he can't believe the number of riders who won't take this on board this is him particularly working with british cycling and he's yeah he he just he just can't believe how other countries haven't kind of the bigger nations have to an extent but but a lot of the sort of more traditional pro teams haven't really taken any of their riders to wind tunnels or anything and it's out there now all this stuff aero road helmets um skin suits in in road races but he says a lot of it comes down to just tradition and fashion and a lot of riders just refuse to sort of get on board. But, but yeah, in terms of what the riders think, I mean, 
I think I think they're quite pleased not to be asked about doping as much that they're as much as before that you know there there is this you know aerodynamics question and and diet and training and um, yeah I mean riders are they're a lot skinnier than they've ever been and I think there are uh, there have been problems in um, women's cycling especially with um, eating disorders um, in in recent years um, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, can there's I, more can to talk about. The, can, I ask, can I put the ethical question to you, Lionel? You're, you're an elite athlete. You're a tour contender. And you're aware of a product that's out there that's not on the banned list. What, and, and it's legal. It's not it's cassoulet. Not, it's right. not cassoulet. <laughs> <laughs> it's not cassoulet. That'd be wonderful if that was a performance enhancer. Yeah. But, um, you know, do you use it? I mean, why wouldn't you use it, in, in a sense? Wow, wow, what a what a what an ethical um, yeah. It's a very good point. I mean, I what would I do? Well, I, I personally I wouldn't. Um, but anyone got any zen on? But, but I think back to the point you made about um, particularly tramadol, which came up during last year's tour as a as a heavy duty painkiller. Now the reports of the zen on gas that. Um, that the uh, Winter Olympics um, athletes, particularly Russians, were using uh, allegedly. Um, Obviously, these are subjects that, uh, these are substances, sorry, that um, already there is a consensus among some of the teams. Garmin particularly have mentioned, um, you know, that they think tramadol should be added to Wada's list. Everything I've read about xenon gas, and I don't know a huge amount about it, but everything I've read indicates that, that it will be banned because, you know, it's an, art, it's, it's an artificial performance enhancer that goes beyond, um, you know, where, where the line is currently drawn. Um, and you mentioned about eating disorders um, and weight being such a crucial part now of, um, you know, in the EPO era, there wasn't the same, um, there wasn't the same imperative to, to be as skinny and as light and, and maximise your power to weight ratio. And so weight loss drugs, there have been a lot of rumours flying around and a lot of accusations that certain riders are skinnier than perhaps they should be. The difficulty is, going back to the question, if my living depended on it and it was the difference between you know, winning these races and making an awful lot of money and not doing so, the, the question is going to be weighing heavy on your mind if you're in any way tempted to cross that line. So the problem is that the substances are, again, and will always be probably ahead of the authorities' um, ability to detect them. Um, and so just because you know, certain improvements have been made with regard to... Um, blood doping, blood boosting, and EPO. It doesn't mean that the, the fight is won at all. So Lionel would do it. Um, I think. I mean, I remember talking to Dave Brailsford uh, at the end of 2010 when he was searching for you know the what what they could do to, to be competitive with uh, with Team Sky. You know, he he talked about the line, and I took that to mean the the line between legality and illegality. And he said, "We will go. We will go up to the line." Um, and he said, "Any elite athlete is." kind of responsibility to go as close to the line as possible and I guess what a lot of people don't understand is professional sport um, for most people a sport is a, is, a, is, is a bit of fun it's an escape um, and there's a sort of a lot of trust that we place in athletes to, to, to honour that it goes back to I suppose the Olympic ideals and fair play and sportsmanship and all the rest of it but professional sport is, is really very very different and there is this disconnect I think between um, what fans think sport is and what it actually is to the the people at that level any other questions? Yep. Um, in cycling unfortunately you seem to be struggling with some of its traditional heartlands particularly Italy, Spain to an extent as well to what extent is that just the economic problems the countries are currently um, experiencing or to what extent is the kind of EPO like, the hangover from that, the lack of Progression in terms of equipment, maybe other things, they were sort of so focused on chemical enhancement, and how much that down from both sides, both riders coming through, and it's sort of set from fans in those countries. I mean, what can they do to? So it sounds like a question for Daniel. Uh, how, how's, how the question is, how is uh, cycling is, is struggling in its heartlands of Belgium, Italy? Spain, not bad. Well, France. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's struggling more more than it is, say, in, in the UK, where it's very popular at the moment. Um, and is that down? Is that economic reasons, or is it a hangover from the the, the doping? How long have you got? You got? <laughs> um, no, this is it's very complex. Um, but I think well, the economic issue is huge. I mean, it's something I've written about actually in um, in the Pantani piece for the anthology. It's also 
I think some of it is a it was avoidable self harm, and some of it was almost unavoidable. It's just a social change um, in cycling and in like, Italian society, particularly. You know, it, cycling in Italy got it, it got very big with the kind of a working class and sort of agricultural um, sort of fan base in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and really. Um, Italy lost a lot of its manufacturing, it lost a lot of it, its kind of working class, lost a lot of its sort of self-esteem, etc. And Italy as a kind of economy started, well, changing and collapsing, and it's kind of coll- it's collapsed over the last few years. And, um, you know, it, it's... So it's lost that, that kind of middle class. That I think the Italian middle... I'm um, sorry, the working class used to identify with cycling so much because it was... They were seeing guys who were essentially doing the same thing that they were doing, going to the factory, clocking on, um, and they were seeing guys suffering on a bike and basically doing the same thing, but showing that you could achieve dreams and you could make people dream, you know, suffering physically, etc. And I think that um, that they've, you know, the, the the working class has been eroded in Italy, and the sort of new middle class just doesn't doesn't really identify with it. And just on a more sort of basic level, um, races are disappearing because um, town councils rightly are not uh, think that it's frivolous expenditure. It is frivolous in the grand scheme of everything that's going wrong in those countries. Um, so they won't contribute. Um, there are no industrial giants that are investing in big teams. And you know we talked about the um, how important things like aerodynamics and and sort of technical support is, and if you've got a, f- a five million pound budget, it's very difficult to compete with a team with a, a fifteen million pound budget. I mean, also just on the on the doping, um, it does worry me still that uh, you, sometimes I think they've got the message, and then sometimes I think they don't. Um, they haven't got it. But the other night um, at the Cannondale training camp, um, Ivan Basso was there, and um, you know I, you know I've got I, I quite like him. He's I've known him. Quite quite well um, over the years um, and I do think that there's a high chance that he's now rides clean but um, there was a team of juniors in the in the hotel where Cannondale was staying and one day one of the I think the direct sportif for the junior team went and asked Basso whether he would do a talk for the riders and he kind of typical of him because he is you know PR wise he's very good and he's also quite a generous guy quite an attentive guy so he said yes and I went and sat in on the talk that he did and um, they talked for about an hour so he gave this speech to the junior team and doping wasn't mentioned once Um, no one would go anywhere near the subject and I just thought how different that was to someone like you know David Miller who perhaps too much perhaps he's made it a bit of a selling point for himself but He's also done a lot of good, David Miller, but that is central to what he thinks he has to give to cycling now, to, that he wants to give back. Whereas to Basso, it's, it's obviously something that, you know, it still has to be skirted around. And, and stuff like that just worries me slightly, that they still haven't really taken on board um, how important that is and, and how much damage it w- did to them as well. With Basso, do you think, is it a sense of, of shame or, or denial? Denial, and he's, he's not really surrounded by a culture which makes him feel any shame because no one mentions it. He's still, you know, even the classic example was a couple of years ago when De Luca, Danilo De Luca, was banned. He was serving a ban, and Italian state television got him on their Giro coverage to do punditry, you know, and no one mentioned the doping. They just said, oh, you know, you'll come back stronger than before when you Danny Lennie's sort of <laughs> <laughs> I mean it's interesting the point you make about the, the working class I wonder you know football in this country was a, a very working class sport but it it thrived through reinventing itself repackaging itself as a middle class sport in the 90s I wonder if that's just something cycling has failed to do in those countries uh, interestingly here it is, it is yeah, a middle it has class packaged sport itself. Yeah. I mean you know like a lot of things with cycling in this country I think cycling in this country benefits from the fact that it had nothing to yeah. grow from, nothing to change from. I think it's almost easier to package yourself as a middle class sport from scratch than it is to repackage yourself having been a working class sport too. And um, there is this big disconnect. Like um, the, it's the 
Italian young people just don't really identify with cyclists. They don't cyclists don't really resonate with them. You know, they're much more interested in Valentino Rossi and and um, actually Basso said an interesting thing about it's also the way the media sells it. Um, football in Italy is, is synonymous with um, well every sports paper now dedicates a lot of space to women in bikinis and fast cars and Basso was saying that he's, he's got a son who's playing in the AC Milan youth team so he's only 9 or 10 but anyway he said you know whatever I do I can't dis- I can't make my son disassociate these sort of symbols of success even for a 9 year old he said my son is thinking football is rich it is in wealth and his cars and he said that you know that's just the way it's packaged and the cycling is just not packaged like that any other questions yep we've got one here now that Discovery Channel bought Eurosport are we moving into an era of uh, multi-million pound rights for races are we moving into a sort of new era of TV coverage for cycling Lionel well, um, given that the rights to all of all but the Tour de France are sold for in in sort of global sports rights terms, peanuts. Um, I I don't know whether suddenly because uh, a company has come in uh, and bought Eurosport that it's going to suddenly in, increase the amount of revenue that that, um, that comes into the sport. I would have thought Discovery Channel are identifying it as something they can pick up cheaply and perhaps develop and and. Um, you know, certainly, if you watch um, the coverage of the, of the races, I mean, we, we all watched Het Newsblad on Saturday. On, well, Richard bought a subscription to Cycling TV, um, but I, th- you know, uh, I watched on an illegal internet feed um, one of the biggest races of the spring. You know, there was no coverage for me to watch. I wanted to watch it. Show your true colours I, tonight. I, like. I should. <laughs> 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 I, I suddenly, take... yeah, I suddenly feel absolutely terrible, <laughs> um, and I shall be taking out a subscription to, uh, <laughs> tonight. Um, but yeah, cycling has got a lot of work to do in terms of making it m- itself um, more appealing to television viewers. Now, personally, I'm probably unusual in that I will sit down and watch the Tour of Flanders from if I'm not there, I'll watch it from the minute it comes on Eurosport to the end. You know. Paris Roubaix the same, the big races the same. If I wasn't at the Tour de France, I would dedicate a lot of time to watching as much of the live coverage as I can. But I accept that the uh, as a percentage of people who will watch sport, um, not everyone is going to dedicate um, that amount of time to watching cycling. And so it's inherently quite a difficult thing to broadcast anyway. Um, it's difficult to tell people what the story is going to be. Even in a cricket match, which plays out over a similar sort of amount of time, you kind of know what everyone is building towards. And I, I know, obviously, everyone's building towards the, the finish line and who's going to win the race, but the narrative unfolds sometimes far too predictably, sometimes very unpredictably, and it's difficult sometimes to put into context what is shown on the screen until you know the result at the end. And so I think cycling has a big um, hurdle to overcome in terms of how it presents itself to a more casual viewer and I think a lot of the technological things that they could do but don't, um, you know, they need to look at fairly urgently, I mean they tried cameras in team cars um, at the Tour of Flanders a few years ago and, and that, was, from, from our point of view, that was brilliant because the package that the Belgian TV company put together was hilarious and it made a few people look a bit stupid, which is why, it didn't, which is why they didn't repeat the experiment. I mean, Jonathan Waters um, sat there um, in the Garmin car. Um, the, the, uh, was, it, was it their car that crashed into the back of somebody else? And, you know, it was just, it was sort of like um, Keystone Cops. But it was great um, entertainment in terms of, sort of whether you can get heart rates on the screen, whether you can get you know graphics that actually show how fast the brake is moving, how fast the bunch is moving. You know these things could be achieved, but there doesn't seem to be at the moment the will to um, to go into those areas. Uh, partly because um, you know at the moment the audience perhaps isn't big enough in the growth. Um, countries and in the traditional countries they're happy with what they've got I mean on on that one of the earlier podcasts we did at the start of the year was um, with David Miller and there's uh, 
a film being made of him this year by Finlay Pretzel, who took part in that that podcast as well. And they're off to Terreno Adriatico next week to film, and they have been given the green light by the UCI to do some quite experimental things with their cameras in terms of where they place them and have more. <laughs> I knew as I was saying that it was, it was going to sound wrong, but um, yeah, they're going to have various motorbikes and they're going to have, I think, possibly bike-mounted cameras and things like that. don't know if I'm supposed to say that, but they're doing that. You're listening to the Humans Invent Cycling Podcast, powered by Sharp. Any other questions? Um, it follows on in some ways, because I think cycling is a sport that is... Um, rebel, the quality of the writing makes a lot of difference to it, because it takes a long time to watch on television. But when that story is condensed in print, it has a life of its own. But that's it. One of the things that happens is there seems a lot of interaction between the journalists and the riders. Now, in most other sports, they, as time goes on, they become more controlling and more paranoid. Do you see this happening in cycling, and is that a threat to its dissemination? So the, the question is um, that, that cycling has, lends itself to good writing because of the perhaps because it takes place over such a long time. I think also we don't we don't see a lot. Perhaps for these reasons, it's difficult to broadcast what goes on inside the peloton. Um, and another reason for the good writing is the the relationships the writers have with the riders. There's a uh, far more accessibility than perhaps in other sports. Is that is that changing? Is that changing? Um, I, yeah, I think it is quite quite quickly. It feels like it feels as though it's accelerated just perhaps in the last couple of years. Um, I mean, Team Sky, for example, famously, I think it was 2010 when they started experimented, didn't they, with um, kind of screens around the team bus, so you know that journalists and fans couldn't really see what was going on. I mean, that's part of the appeal to be able to walk around the buses and 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 see what's going on and get relatively up close and personal. But I mean, buses in themselves as well have have made it difficult from a journalist point of view that riders often just hide on these buses um, and then at the last minute pop out and head to the head to the start. So, you know, you're, you're standing there waiting for, for a long time sometimes to try and grab a, an interview or a quote with someone and, yeah, you can, you can waste a lot of time just, just waiting. And, and PR people and officers as well and teams as well have, have made the process slower that it really was only a, a few years ago, really, that you could ring... A rider up directly for an interview you still can to an extent to, to some of them if you've maybe got a better relationship with them or you've done an interview with them and you, you know you maybe get their direct number but it, it, it is harder and I mean it's still nowhere near the, the likes of football where if you are granted an interview you often have to you know quite quote that it was in um what's mm. the word um <laughs> through through uh Gillette or whatever, you know, a sponsor has to be named. Um, so I think cycling probably is still the, the, you know, very accessible sport for for the media and for fans. But um, no, it, it definitely is going in the the wrong direction. Although I think we we were, you know, I think we're still very lucky as journalists uh, in, in cycling. You know, we do still have the the, the, the access that we have at, at races, even at the Tour de France. You know, as the riders right up to the start you can often grab them for a yeah, word and, and in no other you couldn't stand in the players tunnel um, at Arsenal or something and grab players as they walked onto the pitch and that's effectively what we do and at the lower, at smaller races it's, it's even easier um, so I think we're still you know, you've been to the Middle East tour of Qatar we all stay in the same hotel at these races and you know you can sit down with a rider in the evening and interview them it's not it's, it's, it's maybe it's maybe changed a bit but it's still it's still a world away from a lot of other big money sports. Yeah, I think those early season races and training camps as well. I think often the team is maybe I don't know, you know, a bit kinder almost to the media and like sort of here, here's your chance to get your interviews and you know knowing that you won't perhaps bother them as much later on. I mean, we're, we're also season. lucky. A lot of the riders are not all of them, but a lot of them are are eloquent uh, and they do have great stories and a lot of them are are quite happy to share those stories and it helps you know if somebody is a domestique or does a particular job that perhaps isn't visible to people so sometimes they can be quite happy to get that yeah story I think out you're there. right providing you can get to them which mm. you still can often they're then they're happy to talk to you but but sometimes you're sort of it's the pr officers who are sort of 
saying, well, wait a minute, you need to come through me. And you know, I guess that's where the, the barrier is. Just on the point about the, the sort of the storytelling, I suppose, when, when I first got interested in cycling, there wasn't the wealth of stuff to read on the internet. That, that, well, there wasn't the internet, so you, you, <laughs> you had to wait until uh, Cycling Weekly came out on a, on a Thursday, um, and then you would read an, an account of the race. And then over the years, as, as sort of more stuff, more footage has kind of turned up on YouTube, and I've talked to, particularly in... in um, in the process of doing Sean Kelly's autobiography, asking him about races based on source material from magazines written 30 odd years ago, you realise that you know one account of a race from a journalist uh, or one account of a race from a rider. Um, you know, there's 200 riders in a race. There's 200 stories to be told. And I think one of the things that certain writers in the anthology have done really well is pick out some stories that perhaps are already quite familiar, but look at them from a completely different angle, um, often years later, and add a kind of fresh understanding to something that we think we know a lot about. I think we've, I think we've probably got time for another. Another two questions. So, one there. Uh, the question was: David Miller said in in our earlier podcast that there's no longer a, a patron, a boss, um, and and there isn't the same respect from the younger riders towards the older riders. I suspect that older riders have said this throughout history. I, I think that yeah, I think they all I think they always say this, don't they? Yeah, I mean, I can remember when David Miller was one of those riders who didn't have any respect for anyone who was 10 years older than him. So I think, you know, it's just a natural order of things, isn't it? I yeah. mean, there, and there are, there are. There's, uh, even if they just see themselves as patrons, there's guys like Cancellara who can act like the union leader uh, at times. Um, there are riders, I think, who are respected and perhaps... Yeah, and I think from our point of view, there's, there are a few things more exciting in sport than seeing a kind of young Tyro come and upset the established order. And, you know, when, when Sagan was um, doing his, you know, his goofy victory celebrations a couple of years and Cancellara started getting the hump, I thought that was, you know, that was pretty good. That was pretty, pretty entertaining. And Cancellara, I think, splits opinion because I think some people think that he's, he's overstepped the mark with... You know, he, he almost has tried to take on that um, old patron role, so much so that... Um, some of the riders now refer to him as Chief Commissaire Cancellara. We, we look, I mean, we look back on previous patrons with a certain romanticism, perhaps as well. You know, uh, Bernardino being the, the best example, I think. And I'm sure at the time um, he wasn't. Well, he wasn't. He wasn't at the time universally popular, certainly among the other riders and, and the press as well, because he did. He could. He could nullify races. You know, there was. I, I've just finished a book where I've, I've gone into old stage of the tour and there was one uh, some of you may remember Joe Pellier who won a stage in 1989, he'd made his name a few years earlier at, in, at the tour in his first tour that he rode when he attacked on a day that Bernard Eno had decided was going to be an easy day and he didn't, the message didn't get through to him and he attacked and Eno chased after him and, and, and said you will, never win a, you will never win a bike race and we look back on that now and it's one of the great stories of the tour but really at the time that was a terrible way to behave and and he did nullify that that particular stage of the race and I'm sure you know as much as Cancellara is unpopular among some riders Eno at the time would have been unpopular even if they'd have been scared to tell him that so do we have time for a final question Uh, Dan's touched on it a little bit but with uh, proper stage races coming back what do you think is kind of most depressing or damaging? Is it uh, teams racing to power data or is it armchair power data analysis on the internet? <coughs> okay, cracking question. Um, with state, the stage races about to start again, because it is restricted to stage races, this phenomenon, is it, what's more depressing to spiriting? Is it teams racing to power data or is it the armchair experts attempting to analyse the power data and deduce from that whether somebody is doping or not. Um, Lionel? <laughs> well, um, the, uh, I mean, I find elements of both quite tedious. Um, I mean, I don't particularly... Um, you know, there's, a, there's an awful lot to admire um, about the way Bradley Wiggins won the tour and the way Chris Froome won the tour. Uh, the, I mean, they're, they're in themselves. They're completely different to one another. Um, I try to divorce the fact that Bradley, Bradley Wiggins is British from how I feel about that 
um, 2012 victory and think if he was a, a German or a Spaniard or an Italian, how would we have felt going round France for two weeks or watching on TV for two weeks, pretty much knowing the outcome of the race from the first mountain stage onwards. And really the comparisons go back to sort of Indurain, who did exactly that, Armstrong, who did exactly that. And I have to concede I would feel um, about Wiggins the same way I felt about Indurain and Armstrong, which was that they, they made the Tour de France predictable and I am a fan of unpredictability. Um, so I like the, the fact that there's a sort of loose cannon, a kind of a firework that can go off someone like Quintana. They bring the race alive for me. When it comes to the analysis of the, um, the, the climbing performances and this kind of performance-based suspicion that we have now, and it will kick off again as soon as the riders start climbing the familiar climbs, is that the variables are so great it seems to me, and the the prickliness of the scientists who are um, putting forward their analysis is so great that I just have no faith in um, their findings. They they can't know... uh, There's so much about a a stage or a mountain and a rider that they cannot know. You know, have they they weighed the rider that morning? Have they weighed the bike? Um, Do they know, you know, on a 14-kilometre climb... If you choose one line round each corner or another line round each corner, is it still 14 kilometres or is it 14.1 kilometres? Does that how much does that throw out? And there's no the the, the sort of the familiar scientists who are putting forward this data and saying that this performance must mean uh, you know th- th- this means this performance is questionable because I've estimated this. When challenged about their data. They, they behave very unscientifically. Scientists like to put forward their findings and then allow their peers to kind of, um, you know, review it. And we don't really see that in cycling. And I think if we're going to go down that route, then it would have to be, it would be good if we were able to do it in a far more scientific way. And then it becomes credible and, and, and perhaps means something. I don't want the Tour de France to be about time, riders being timed on climbs. I find that it, it goes against everything that I love about the Tour de France in particular. Um, and I don't buy. I don't. I don't either. I don't think we know enough to know that a certain performance, if the figures are accurate, that a certain performance equals doping. I don't think we know enough about how the human body works, what it's capable of. I mean, the example of you. I may have mentioned this already on a previous podcast, but I had this discussion with a guy at an event in Glasgow where, it, and it was a great Graham O'Brien event, and we were. He was talking, you know, Graham O'Brien set the hour record in 93. There's no doubt at all that if, they, if Graham O'Brien did, that, did a performance like that now, people would, would definitely think he was doping. I, I mean, I don't think he was doping, but the fact is he broke uh, a record held, that, was, that had been set by a rider who was blood doping nine years earlier uh, at altitude, and Francesco Moser was one of the, one of the greats. Um, and here's a, a little known Scottish amateur who, who did break the hour record. You know, he's fortunate that he did it at that time and it was hailed as a, a great athletic achievement, which I believe it was. But had he done that now, there's no question at all that people would be deeply, deeply suspicious. I mean, we've talked about um, just in terms of the threshold, this imaginary threshold above which someone must be doping. I mean, we've talked about um, how fallible some of the calculations are and how many other variables there are um, you know, technology, etc. I mean, one thing that I think also gets ignored is um, if you just think of how big and how diverse the talent pool is now in professional cycling to what it was 15 years ago. You know, I talked earlier about how cycling was a working class sport in Italy and it was in France and it was in Spain. Basically, you were every single professional cyclist was from a work was white Caucasian from a white and um, from a working class background in four countries now I mean it's still not diverse you know they still are predominantly white Caucasian but um, middle class kids um, from Kazakhstan from America from Belgium you know it's the, 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 the standard should have risen exponentially disproportionately because the talent pool is so much bigger and so much more diverse and I was just going to add I, I think sort of for every Every cynic, I think there's, you know, an, another person who's thoroughly enjoyed watching the performance. And I mean, yeah, these, you know, cynical people tend to be the ones who are quite vociferous on, on Twitter or the internet. And I mean, the national aspect that um, Lionel brought up there, I mean, a lot of people would have thoroughly enjoyed watching Wiggins and Froome 
dominate, you know, and, and at last for the Brits to be doing well. And yet, on the other hand, like Lionel said, if, if it had been a, a Spaniard or an Italian dominating it in, in, that, in that fashion, then, yeah, we, th- those same people might have sort of found it really boring or, or indeed asked ask questions of them. I think, you know, the, the Lala said cynical, I think it, as journalists and every, everybody who, who loves the sport has got to be sceptical because of the, the recent history. Um, but I, I think there are, um, there are grounds for scepticism in some cases and in some cases there aren't. Um, and uh, I personally, I'm not somebody who's going to base my scepticism on on, on estimates of power data. I don't, can we can we have one final question? One final question because that was a bit of a that was a bit of a downer that one. Um, sorry, yeah, right right at the back. Women's yeah, women's road cycling. Um, in the track cycling context, there is sort of parity there because it doesn't have the history and tradition I think. And so, in in road cycling, there is a women's tour of Britain this year. There's definitely progress being made. You know, I think that. Um, someone like Marianne Voss is a very marketable star um, and uh, Laura Trott in this country uh, Lizzie Armistead and those people are very important but the races are very important as well but it, it, is, it does it does you know there has been talk of a women's a women's tour de France and I think that a women's tour of Britain is, is better it's a new event in a new place and a chance for an event to become the the sort of premier event for women without piggybacking on the a me, a, an established men's event. Um, I think it almost has to develop as a, almost like a different sport in a way. Yeah, I think sport, whether it's male sport or female sport, needs stories. It needs characters. It needs rivalries. And I think the the women's tour um, that's going to be happening in uh, early May, you know, has has the perfect platform to create some of those stories. I mean, Mariana Voss is, um, you know, pound for pound, probably up there with Peter Sagan as the best sort of all-round cyclist in the world. She can do absolutely everything, um, cyclocross, um, track, time trialling, road, stage racing. So, you know, this is an opportunity, if they market it correctly, if they get a bit of TV coverage, um, you know, to, to tell people that, this is the very best in the world coming to compete here, and that will capture, slowly capture the imagination. It may not happen immediately, um, but I think there has been more of a willingness, certainly for um, you know the newspapers that cover track cycling. They don't discriminate between um, you know men and women. They want they want winners, and so the, the last week's um, track world championships with Joe Rousel, particularly Laura Trott getting a medal as well. You know, they're stories that, that, that newspapers and, and, and magazines will want to sell will want to tell um, and people will want to read about. And I think the more platform there are for those stories to be told, um, the more the level of the uh, the profile can come up. Uh, yeah, I, I think um, 2014 is going to be a real sort of crunch year for women's cycling. I mean, it's it's fantastic that it's the um, the, the organisers of the Tour of Britain who are doing this women's tour in in May, um, and the field they've got is is amazing. They've got anyone who's anyone coming really. Um, but um, I we keep we keep name dropping, don't we? It's terrible. But I was speaking to um, Katie Colclough the other day for this book I'm doing, who's the um, team time trial world champion. She won it with the um, specialised Lululemon team uh, last last year, the end of last year, um, and that was her final race. She retired. And I still didn't really understand why she'd retired. And I, and I spoke to her about this. And I wanted her to sort of say how terrible, you know, women's cycling was. I expected that her answer to be that, you know, you can't make money and it's, you know, doesn't get any coverage. But uh, her answer was quite sort of, yeah, not what I, I expected. She was actually sort of just saying, well, actually, I found it difficult being away from home all the time. And, you know, she, she, she didn't really like that it was going in a sort of more corporate direction, which weirdly is a, is a good thing I think it is sort of um, perhaps catching up with um, with men's cycling so yeah I, I think I think this year could be could be really key and I know a lot of people are pushing for a, a full women's tour de France um, and it is only a, a one day race on the final day but um, nevertheless I think we've sort of moved on quite quite a long way this year yep so Daniel, have you anything to add to that? Not really, just more TV coverage. Just however it can get it, it just desperately needs more TV coverage, I think. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming along. I think there will be opportunities to buy the cycling anthology back here. We've got to ask Frank, which was our top question? 
I think we give it to the man in the hat. The man in the hat. I hope I didn't influence that. It was a good question. So, future Team Sky director Sporty for the question about the uh, race radios. Well done. Uh, got your got your tickets here. It's track racing, I'm afraid. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming along. Great turnout. Hope, hope this is the first of many events that we'll do here. Frank. Yeah, absolutely. Great, thank you. Uh, see, see you next week. Um, so, I'm Richard Moore. Thank you, Daniel Freib. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Lionel Burney. Thank you. And thank you, Ellis Bacon. Thank you very much. The Cycling Podcast with humansinvents.com. Innovation, craftsmanship, and design.